thing. And I'm being recorded. Okay. Do I can or right, continue that um, share share desktop? All right. And can everyone see this? All right. I see some some heads. All right. So that's uh, yeah. That's my title: Contemporary Diagnosis and Treatment of CMD and Facial Pain and Implications for Behavioral Health. I think Julie came up with that title. Mm -hmm. uh, there's where I practice. Uh, you guys know where this is. Um, and love, I hope they keep the bridge. I don't know where everyone stands, but it's going to really mess up my view. Uh, but anyhow, um, so it's a little bit about me. Yeah, I am. So um, treating TMD in dentistry is kind of not a, a popular thing among dentists, but because of what I've learned in becoming um, you know, a problem solver, as Julie said, uh, with certain, uh, you know, scenarios, it has led me to this body of research and um, ways of, of helping people that I wasn't anticipating. So, yeah, I'm a board certified implantologist. However, uh, I treat um, TMD and facial pain, which is not a very common um, thing for among dentists. So, um, so signs and symptoms of myogenous based TMD is muscle based. Uh, we're going to talk about influence of myogenous TMD on the Beck depression inventory scale, um, how the neurology and neuroanatomy affects uh, the trigeminal nerve affects the um, really uh, the whole circuit from the tooth to the brain. Um, we're going to look at computerized occlusal technology and analysis with the text scan, comparing that to how uh, um, yeah, white papers are traditionally used or teeth are um, evaluated now. And I'm going to show some cases of this, this you're going to hear this term, uh, don't be worried about, it. don't be scared of it, <laughs> which is how I called it eye cage, uh, immediate complete anterior guidance development, uh, which is basically a procedure. Um, and, it, and this is what exclusion time is all about. And uh, talking about occlusion and the muscles and all that. So this all comes down to the, you know, what's going on in people's heads and let's delve into it. So everyone doing all right? Can you hear me? Thumbs up. All right. So TMD, TMJ. Uh, you know, people say I got TMJ, which is not really. It's like saying I have I have knee, you know, or I have thumb. You know, it doesn't really mean anything. The TMJ is a joint, but TMD is temporal temporal mandibular disorder. So the head to the jaw. Uh, there's quite a a number of subcategories within TMD. It's a broad diagnosis, um, and typically it's acute or chronic pain associated with the jaw, the joint, and or the muscles. So it could be jaw, muscles, joint, all of the above. Um, the TMJ is the joint, like I said, and it's uh, ganglioarthroidal, ganglioarthroidal, which means that it does two actions. It hinges and it glides. Uh, so uh, the first part of your opening is it basically uh, just rotates, hinges, and then the last portion slides forward. You can try it with your jaw right now. I want to see everyone do that. Let's see Ron. All right, good. Try with your food. Um, the articular disc is a is cartilaginous disc between. It's basically uh, helps the jaw slide and some muscles attached to it, it absorb some shock um, from that as well. And that's where that you hear disc clicking and sort of popping and those sorts of things, which uh, some of you may have heard or had. Um, and these muscles are all innervated uh, by the trigeminal nerve. TMD is pretty serious uh, ailment in the U.S. It's costing about, I, I estimate, well, from some of these late, latest figures, eight billion annually. Eighty percent are affected are women, uh, twenty percent men. So that's pretty significant that uh, women are more affected uh, by TMD than men, uh, which is, you know, has to go with how individuals uh, respond to, you know, certain uh, predilection for symptoms. Uh, roughly 20 million people in the U.S. And it's um, broadly misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, and even in the dental profession, it's not really well um, understood or treated, unfortunately, and hence why I am taking it on somewhat. Um, and uh, this is also, well, that's a 17 billion daily, but um, second reason why people visit their doctor, one in four households have someone that suffer from migraines and 130 million lost work days uh, from my, just from migraines. So this, this is more migraines, not just TMD. Um, 
so significant. So when so someone comes to my office, I have a questionnaire that uh, I have them fill out that's I created and uh, covers some things that aren't pretty typical for a dental office. So, you know, you have pain in your jaw, right? Noise in the joint, maybe, but um, certain things such as, um, you know, dizziness, nausea, um, pain in the eyes, itchiness or stuffiness in the ears, ringing, buzzing, hissing in your ears, um, sinus related trouble, migraines, of course, we're talking about. And, um, you know, do you have headaches? Headaches are, the, uh, are, are a big problem with myogenes TMD. Do you feel you clench your teeth? So this is sort of the history I take to kind of get a sense as anyone's dealing these things, because it may not be uh, something that was they were ever asked or know to talk about um, to a, with a dentist. So as a new patient, someone coming in, I typically have them fill this out. Um, so, and with that, the symptoms of, of TMD, MI, and STD are pretty um, broad. Uh, you know, it can affect almost every area of the, of the face. Um, and some of these things or symptoms are not always uh, understood by the medical professionals and dentists that these are most like could be a, a TMD issue. Um, so, you know, head pain, obviously, migraine stuff, but trouble with the eyes, um, sensitivity to sunlight, I've seen. Um, mouth discomfort is obviously one would be, you would think would be TMD. Um, yeah, Clint, can you guys see this in detail fairly well? So a myriad of different areas can be affected. Ear problems, hissing, hissing buzzing, ringing, decreased hearing, itchy vertigo is another uh, sign that I, I see or symptom that I see with this. Um, actual mechanical problems of the jaw, clicking, popping with a disc, pain in the face, uh, lack of mobility, stiffness in the neck, sore muscles and throat, even uh, difficulty swallowing and uh, soreness in the throat and hard times with swallowing. So, so this, uh, this is a study we look at is what, what happens if your bite's off, right? You know, things aren't, um, you know, aligned properly. And so they, they took 30 rats in the study and um, they gave them a, a, a filling that was high on one side, all right? And then one, they took a radiograph uh, and showing their, their spine and curvature. And then a week later, they took another radiograph and they showed that some significant cur curve uh, has developed um, in, in the spine of the, of the rat. And part of this is all just as obviously due to muscle pull, muscle imbalances, okay? A week later, they added um, a uh, balancing comp composite resin or basically balanced out the filling you put in. So it's both sides are hitting and the spine went back to normal. So um, it shows you about what this does to the neck and thorax. If, if this were to be a human, what, what can this do? All right, for, for today's uh, lunch and learn or bag lunch, whatever you want to call this, um, I found something that has to do with psychology. Okay, so, and there's many great studies. This is one of the, the, the wonderful things about this treatment that there is a lot of literature and, um, this study in particular, I gave to uh, Julie, so you guys can all take a look at it. But this talks about the Quebec depression inventory uh, scores in TMD subjects after um, a DTR treatment or measured occlusal treatment. And so um, one of the best things, Julie was kind of getting into this a little bit. I can tell she pays attention to me now because she actually understands a lot of it, which is pretty impressive. But I'm going to read from the, um, the introduction just because they, they said it perfect. And um, so just bear with me on this um, just for a short bit. Uh, temporal mandibular disorders include numerous physical diagnoses, which can have significant negative effects on a patient's quality of life, such as a reduction in the, the emotional well being of a patient who lives with chronic pain, has been documented in the psychosocial dental literature. One subcategory of myalgia has been shown to be have particularly onerous effects upon life quality. Some authors have theorized that myalgia can be central nervous system mediated, but to date, there's no convincing evidence to support that belief. Regardless of this potential etiology, chronic pain of the masticatory muscles has been shown to be associated with negative emotional sequelae. Some authors claim that painful, chronic, and dysfunctional TMD symptoms arise from both physiological causations and emotional anxiety depression precipitated by patients' life stresses. 
this unproven myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome theory suggests that emotional stress exacerbated physical stressors upon the spinatomatic system, which led to the appearance of chronic painful symptoms. Additionally, psychologists and psychiatrists advocate that CMD patients overreact emotionally to their chronic pain. Or I don't know if that's you guys, so don't take that personal. Um, whereby the research diagnosis, diagnostic criteria for temporal mandibular disorders avoided the underlying physiologic, physical pathology and postulated that structure breakdown or dysfunction were secondary to anxiety, depression, uh, and, or, and or somatization. Cognitive behavioral therapy was then recommended to reduce the patient's stress, so hopefully reduce the clenching and grinding habits that could damage the teeth, muscles, and temporal mandibular joints, um, which was not effective. Um, so um, another theory in TMD advocates that TMD is an occlusal-based, occlusal occlusion precipitated disorder, although neither centric relation by manual position, which is a dental technique, don't worry about this jargon, it's almost a dental jargon that you don't need to know, but I'm gonna just go through it. Myocentric muscle determined occlusal positioning have resolved all masticatory muscle um, TMD symptoms. They've, they have not done that, but how they have had had some success in treating some of the symptoms. Another measure, computer-guided occlusal adjustment procedure, which is a DTR, that advocates the duration of posterior excursive contacts are neurologically responsible for muscular TMD symptoms. It's demonstrated in multiple published studies that muscular TMD symptoms have an occlusal ideology. The immediate complete anterior guidance development, coronoplasty, reduces excursive movement, exclusion times, and significantly lessens masticatory muscle hyperactivity by minimizing periodontal ligament compression durations. Studies so repeatedly show that eye cage resolves many muscular symptoms. So in this study, um, the object was to identify TMD uh, subjects and they completed um, their uh, initial, I'm gonna move this cause I can, can't see my whole uh, sidebar here. So you need a moment. Know where my mouse is. Um, I should be all right. So, anyways, 83 subjects uh, with muscular TMD symptoms treated with the eye cage to shorten the exclusion times uh, during lateral excursions. Prior to treatment, uh, three weeks later and three months. Okay. This is in the way here. Let's see if I can. There we are. Better. Okay, there's limited literature about the psychological testing is used with TMD patients who undergo occlusal treatment. The Beck Depression Inventory BD2 is widely used. 21 questions, mood measuring, emotional assessment device, it reliably detects and scores and degrees of depression. The specific aim of this study was to determine in a carefully selected group of TMD subjects whether BDI2 scores would be altered by subjects undergoing measured computer guided occlusal treatment. So the results of the study were that significant reductions in exclusion time were seen at three weeks. So that's the treatment being done. The, 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 the treatment was, was clinically successful and at three months. Um, functional pain and symptom frequency significantly decreased after three weeks and further after three months with significant p-values. Um, and you can see the uh, down at the... Uh, the table here that the frequency of headaches has gone down significantly in patients uh, from their pre-treatment to their three weeks post to three months post. Uh, so significant finding there. And the uh, resultant results of the, <clears throat> the BDI two show that uh, if you can see in the lower left, the left side, the pre number of pre-treatment subjects, the score was over 40, there was 21 subjects over 40. 22 at 31 to 40, 21 to 22 at 21 to 30. So significantly high levels there should be related to extreme depression, severe and moderate. And as we go to the right uh, down the timeline, we can see that, well, initially a lot of them went right after the three weeks went down to the one to 10, which is up, normal up and down, so it's normal. Um, and 
in three months, even more were there. So, all right, I'm probably gonna put you guys back on the screen so I can see um, participants. So, say, all right. <clears throat> okay, so that's a nasty picture. I'm really sorry about that. It is lunchtime probably for you folks. Um, but there's clinical signs of occlusal problems and disease the chipping away at the gum line of the teeth here. Um, it's not just from your toothbrush, which they like, um, people, uh, certain professionals like to tell you. So the, the posterior teeth do have a specific um, um, canoreceptor and it's unique in the neuroanatomy. We're gonna talk a little bit about neuroanatomy here and show you why this happens. As Julie mentioned that, it's kind of an interesting neurologic circuit. Um, and the posterior tooth PDL, so this is just your back teeth, your molars, premolars, bicuspids, whatever you want to call them. Um, they have their afferent or their incoming uh, sensor, the only peripheral nerve, uh, the first synapse inside the CNS. So if we look at a cross section here, and I think we all took neuroanatomy at some point, right? Um, We'll kind of look at the brain stem and how this, what this means. A little close-up view on uh, the trigeminal nerve and uh, the mesencephalic nucleus. That's the top portion. But this is somatic afferent data. So this is your sensory coming into the brain. And as you notice, the uh, we're going to draw the arrows here. Um, it's coming in on the screen line and going right to the cell body, which is in the mesencephalic nucleus. And what happens is that both that this nucleus immediately um, synapses to the same side and, and contralateral trigeminal motor uh, nucleus. And so um, there's most basically an instantaneous effect, um, uh, pretty much un uncontrollable uh, is what it, what it means um, to be. So that's along the lines of, well, well, why does that, why is, you know, thinking about, you know, the cognitive behavioral or, or whatever, why is that not helping? Why is that showing anything? Well, because there's a real hard line hardwired uh, reaction to this in, in people. And if we look at the structures that are innervated by the trigeminal motor nucleus, we see the, the masticatory muscles, which are your chewing muscles, which is a lot of them, and the tensor tympani, which pulls on the eardrum, um, or basically if you, you hear a loud sound, it will, it will flex and help you protect uh, your eardrum. And it also is why when you swallow whatever, your, your ears can pop um, like an airplane. That's your Valley Palatini. That's another uh, muscle that goes in and pulls on your station tube and the pop will be. Uh, so these muscles that all can be hyperactive and cause a lot of deep head pain. Um, the myohyoid, which is underneath the, the, the jaw and digastric, those are both, both like swallowing muscles. So uh, all those are innervated by this and potentially uh, made worse. So this mechanism of what happens to patients in their mouth, um, basically is um, it's a, a positive feedback loop. It's a cyclical action. So uh, if, if we have our back teeth hitting longer and heavier and they're not separating or we're chew as we're chewing, we're gonna have um, what we call clinically a, a, a long posterior, posterior disclusion time or a long disclusion time. All right, if it's long, it's going to compress these ligaments. So that means that's going to, um, when the, the ligaments are compressed and the canoreceptor in the ligament gets, you know, your teeth aren't just locked in bone. There's a, there's a ligament that tells you where you're really small, that gives you feedback, tells you how your bite feels, you know, where your teeth are, some proprioception. Um, and when that's compressed, that's triggered, it triggers this. And these afferent fibers will go into your CNS, we're going down the, um, uh, slide here and uh, um, will trigger your trigeminal motor nucleus as I talked, which will increase contractions. All right, because that'll send an efferent motor stimulus to it, and that's your temporalis, your master. Um, positive feedback, it's going to keep happening with every time you chew. Lactic acid builds up in the muscle fibers, and it can lead to um, some toxic ischemia, lack of oxygen, hypoxia, and it, it just keeps on going on. Now, you know, in a lot of times night guards or whatever we may to be putting away can help a little bit, but they don't really ever resolve the problem because you're always um, basically, whenever you take that out and chew, you're chewing with, with this bad system. 
So the exclusion time duration is basically how long that the back teeth hit uh, when you grind left and right. Some people are locked in, some people have open bites. So it's really specific to the patient. Um, so measurement of frictional duration and the posterior occlusal surfaces interact during a function. Does that kind of make sense? I'm, I don't see anyone on the screen right now. So you could have all left, I don't know. Um, <laughs> can, how, how's, are we all seeing, is everything going well? It makes so sense, Jim, it's Kate. It makes total sense to me. I just had a quick question. Sure. So the, are these patients also coming in with like tooth pain in this area or is it more like this kind of like radiating out to other parts of their face or jaw or, you know, I'm just curious, like, you know, if someone, cause people will often report to me that they have, yeah, maybe migraine headaches or TM, the TMJ. Um, would they off also have like tooth pain at the sort of the site of this issue? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the tooth pain is, is kind of for, for common dentists, it's like in their wheel. Yeah. Well, I know your tooth pain and then you're having it, but then they'll say, can't really resolve why and what, why it's happening or, or resolve that issue. So it's not, it'll be a tooth pain that's not related to like a cavity or, um, you know, a recent filling or something, inflammation in the nerve that, or, or, you know, uh, periodontal infection, you know, something that's got a different cause. If the, if the, the cause of it is, is occlusion and manner, there will be symptoms. There'll be, uh, it's very common. In fact, I think one out of three people have, you know, some sort of, of symptoms in their teeth be, uh, and or face because of, because of this. So yes, um, it will be, it would be uh, cold sensitive, be uncomfortable eating. A lot of people are just really uncomfortable with chewing in general. They chew slowly, eat slow, uh, those things. So are you saying there would always be a tooth related ailment in addition to symptoms like migraine or vertigo or other pain? Not necessarily. No, that's the, that's the, one of the signs would be, is it? No, it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily have a, a <clears throat> A corresponding to sensitive to cold or bite, you may just have a pain in the jaw muscles. You could have, um, but you know the the system's built itself up over time. Like your teeth have, have, have the ligaments build them up, the bone builds up around your teeth, the, the nerve recedes away from your tooth as, in time. So you kind of uh, the teeth themselves stabilize, but you still have these other disorders because of the muscles. So typical muscle. Uh, Symptom, or two symptoms, like, you know, like I said, cold sensitivity, all that maybe go away, but you're still having it on the muscle or you've evolved out of it, but you still have these major muscle um, issues. Um, can I ask one more question or just because I actually looked at the article you sent this morning very briefly, but it seemed like it was concluding that psychologists would often infer that grinding or jaw pain could be caused by symptoms of depression or anxiety and that by treating the depression and anxiety, we might reduce the incidence of grinding. But you're saying in the research they found that once they sort of cured, if that's the right word, the, um, the occlusion or the bite, that that actually uh, lifted the symptoms of depression. So the causal arrow goes from, no, the depression is caused by the pain versus either grinding or whatever is caused by the depression. Does that, is that what? Yeah. I mean, so I, I, there's definitely a, whether a patient has depression or anxiety or not, if they have this, this failed um, propensity to, to be susceptible to this long exclusion time issues, then it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. However, obviously I think, you know, you see with the patients and people will, they're anxious, they have something coming up. Uh, presentation, whatever they, they clench their teeth the night before, or, or you know, so that would be like, okay, well, that's exacerbating it shortly. So if you can treat some of the, uh, I mean, this is my in my experience. I mean, the article, you know, itself, you can look at the references and um, really dig up, dig those apart, and and see what the, um, <clears throat> the literature is there. Uh, but for the most part, what I see is that uh, it's still the same circuit, and may yeah, maybe be amplified, but um, it's that the, um, I mean, I mean, there's still some dental 
professionals that think that oh, this is all cognitive, this is all in your head, there's really nothing wrong with you. Um, and, uh, you know, it's basically, um, it's in your head. There's, there's, and that, that's the problem. It's not a actual physiological, you know, it's something that you have control over, I guess, in that sense. So if you had the beginning mechanism, it will make anxiety and would make that worse. Is that what I'm saying? If that makes sense. Yeah, but that also the evidence showed that depression subsided greatly once treatment occurred for the the bite. Absolutely. Well, it shows that that it's not. I mean, it's not really. Um, that unfortunately, uh, if it is pain, you know, pain, chronic pain, and people in pain, um, you know, they're 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 suffering, and a lot of the patients I see will be looking for a solution. Every day they wake up, they look, they're searching and looking and I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. And then they'll come by me and they, they're not referred by dentists because dentists don't really know. It's almost you have to be in that cycle of pain or that uncomfortable in your life to look at what can I do about this? Who, who treats this? And then read and you find some YouTubes or whatever. And then my name pops up on a search or something. And you read a little, little bit and you say, okay. Um, and those are typically the patient's on them that they're directively you know searching looking and that affects their uh you know overall anxiety and well-being are you guys hearing me it says my connection's unstable <laughs> oh it was glitchy for a minute but usually it, i think it's resolved Thanks. All right, so just getting back to, I mean, maybe we could talk about that a little bit at the end, um, uh, you know, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, it was, if you look at the study results that their, their back inventory scale went way down after treatment, that this, you know, having headaches to having to take medicine, all that severely affected their, significantly affected their uh, anxiety or depression. So measurement of muscle activity and group function, so just some muscle. So these are, as you can see in the screen, this is our EMG uh, sensors. I hook them up to, I don't do all of them like they do here, but temporalis and master muscles. And this will give us readings on, you know, firing an activity of muscle during rest and biting. So here's an example. You'll see a little bit more of this in a moment. To do this this treatment, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the treatment and show you some cases of why this works. So we talked about the neurology of it, but we'll need to be bio EMGs for the muscle reading the muscle um, levels, seeing where they're at, seeing the health of the muscle, and the T scan. So there you see a picture of uh, commonly what we see is a, a is a um, in the assistant's hand is a T scan sensor, um, and basically that's what we measure the bite with and. Uh, she has her bio EMG sensors on the neck on her temporalis, which is the, next to the eye, the master, which is you know just in front of the ear. Okay, and so we talked to it's you know this is basically immediate complete anterior guidance development. Basically, what is IKH? It's it's engaging your canines the way the maker wanted you to, I guess. If you want to say it that way that the posterior teeth uh, that that cause um, you know, hyperactivity, then the canines, they d diminish it. It's, it's a, it's different. So the posterior teeth will have this positive feedback, but however, if you engage a canine, um, the way we're designed to be, then all of a sudden all those forces stop. So, uh, that's what the goal is, is to basically get, um, patients, um, to be using their, their anterior teeth the way they were meant to be guided and certain things can change that, you know, lack of teeth, open bites, uh, braces, orthodontics, all those things, fillings in the back, um, all that. And the great thing about this is it's splint free, you know, you don't have to use um, splints, uh, occlusal guards, night guards, those sort of things. So I was up late last night drawing these, actually, no, that, this was Ella. Ella drew these photos, uh, pictures for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is the procedure. It's basically one of the ways of getting a patient into AK, eye cages um, and DTR is to adjust through the enamelplasty, coronoplasty, altering the shape of the, the teeth. Here's an example. This is from Dr. Kirstein's slides, uh, one of his patients, but patient has um, hitting 
excessively in group function there, uh, which basically means your back teeth hit when you separate your teeth, not your front. Um, he's adjusted the patient there, lessened the marks. And that gets me to this point. So uh, part of this treatment that is really essential is this, this thing right here, this T-scan, um, sensor text scan, and it's a digital occlusal technology sensor. And it's absolutely vital for this. So it's not very thick, you know, traditionally you can see on, you know, if you get filling or whatever done, Dennis, you have a, your occlusal paper, which is right next to this, the sensor there, that blue rectangle. And that's about 200 microns thick. This is about 100, which is four mils, which is about the size of your uh, contractor garbage bag. All right, that's about three mils, right? Uh, for those of you stuff leaves and all that. So fairly, really thin. And um, why is this significant? Well, this is kind of those aha things in uh, my profession and, and going through this, but um, research shows that a big paper mark, which is, you know, we're trained in dental school to say the big marks are the high spots and all that, um, is only actually accurate 14% of the time. So that if you're adjusting your bite, you're filling your mouth and trying to get things to feel better, that uh, even no matter how many uh, you know, occlusion courses you take it or your experience that you're just not capable of measuring, which is the highest spot. If you ask Dennis, you know, which is the highest spot, they would probably see in that premolar. Uh, but as you can see, this is a, the T-scan data. This will show, well, the back molar is, is actually the highest one hitting, but it doesn't leave a, a significant mark. It's just a little blue, black speck. So, um, sorry, wrong direction. And if we look at these markings, you might say like, you see a molar, a premolar molar there, and that molar has a lot of red on it. And so you guys haven't had bad education yet. So it'll probably make total sense to you, but that's just the ink smearing. Where's really the high spot on this? Well, it's actually back on, you can see the circle on the bottom right. So, Inherently in the, uh, the ugly bottom of my profession, which is uh, pretty significant, um, this technology is rarely used to uh, treat people and there's thousands and thousands of procedures being done daily. Uh, and some of them uh, will, will be causing problems because the bites aren't accurately, there's, what we were trained and what we were use is not sufficient. So studies show dentists using correct context 86 to 87% of the time. That's pretty, that's pretty bad. Um, furthermore, so if you're in this, you know, your back teeth are hitting, you can see uh, this is this, this, this muscle activity. Let's say we put a crown on or whatever, and, and all of a sudden um, it's, an, it's just not the right, wrong patient or the, the patient that you know, is, is susceptible to this. What you'll get is you'll get this massive uh, muscle firing because it's what you're trained to do um, or what your evolutionary mechanism you know you, if you look at a, a you know a canine and they want to chew through a bone then where do they put it they put it in the very back portion underneath the jaw on um, on their molar muscles uh, i mean molars um, and that's and that way they can recruit they can just cut through every like you know they don't put it on their front teeth another way to look at this is like okay we'll try to bite into a pencil and you know, if you put on your back teeth, second molars, you can crush right into it. But if you put on your front teeth and try to bite into it, you can't really get too far into it. So if we remove those contacts and excursive uh, interferences, what we get is we get our EMGs cleaned up. Okay, so, and here's a comparison. This, and the, the, the most amazing thing is that this is neurologically immediate. You know, a nerve fires or it doesn't, right? A neuron fires or it doesn't fire. Now, if it doesn't fire, what happens is you you get this complete lack of, of fire. It just turns it's turned off this whole circuit. So this is the same patient treated by Dr. Kirstein. And uh, the right set, left side is pre, right side is after. And you can see there's half of the half of the fire is going on. And that relates to less symptoms, less muscle pulls on structures, less spasticity and ischemia and all that. So I'm going to show you a few of my patients, and these cases are fairly old. Um, I've been doing this for about six years. I don't say old, but um, uh, so this is my questionnaire pain in the jaw, right side. 
you know, I, I kind of look at this like a Christmas tree, how much lit up, you know, and what of it is really bad. Um, but this pa patient is having, you know, what I'm looking for is, what, is the myogenous, the muscle-based um, symptoms, because that's what really the, this, um, anything that mu is muscle-related is really help. So describe your chief concern, tightness in the right side of jaw, jaw cracking, jaw being guarded at times, prevent hitting front tooth off and on. So guarding unconfident with a bite has pretty significant history. I'm not gonna get into all that most of them do. Uh, but if you measure the bite uh, for this patient, you can see that uh, she's very heavy on her, her second molars. Does this is make sense? So this is a distribution. The top left would be a distribution of her teeth, the teeth numbers are two to 15 up top, right? So the, um, you're looking at the distribution of where the forces are. And if you look at the bot, it should, you know, you think it will be all, all balanced and all across, but they're not, and they're typically not. Um, but, uh, you know, in this patient is 41% on a um, second molar number two there and 36% on number 15. So pretty unbalanced. Is this making sense? or inbounds. All good? You still hearing me? You're good. Okay. Yep. Um, so here we are, we treated this, this lady and her balance is previously at left side, right side is after treatment. So and you can see we can, we have a, uh, better balance and distribution of front. I'm actually engaging that peak uh, on the right side, top right is actually a canine, which is what we want. Canines, we want canines to touch. And as a result, we have um, cleaned up the, the EMGs and we have our measurement um, and within what we consider the clinical um, realm where it's, patients start to get better, which that first scene found is less than half a second. Um, if you can get off your posterior teeth, then typically your muscles will relax. Okay, so that's patient there. So left side, right side, and clean up the muscle, EMGs. And this is the post-DTR evaluation. Um, and all she had was can make jaw pop or crack. Well, that's okay, because that's not something that's not a really goal of treatment, just to know that okay, occasionally I, I pop or crack. So that it's just usually um that's, that's not really related to any pain or discomfort. It's just a, it's an artifact. So uh, really wonderful resolution. Zinging on upper right a couple of days last week. All right, whatever that means. But got that and a nice little card here. Yeah. Thank you so much for the patience and understanding you have shown me. Since the first time I walked into your office, you're, well, it says nice things. Um, but this is a, it's definitely a challenging uh, thing for patients and communication with two patients about why and how, what. Um, and here's a nice review we got. I'm so happy. Um, following my treatment plan using DTR, adjust my bite, crown replacement, replacement with the implant. I'm happy to say I'm now pain free. My crowns are a perfect match. I can yell my favorite foods and no longer sleeping with a moth guard. So that's cool. Here's a, a patient with migraines. It's history of, uh, you know, <clears throat> unable to work, a disability, diagnosed with fibromyalgia, Botox treatments, um, and bite appliances, which typically are all treat the symptoms. They don't only really treat the root cause, you know, Botox, patients ask me about Botox and, um, you know, if it's something where I can't get the bite to be, to line up appropriately, I can't do the eye cage procedure, then that might be what we have to do. But um, for the most part, that only does treat symptoms. Chewy foods initiate um, flossing migraines there. Pain in the right and left jaw, pain while chewing a bagel and gum, avoiding certain foods. A lot of patients have difficulty opening wide. Yawning is different. Jaw aches when opening wide. Pain in the ears, or eyes, excuse me, hearing loss, stuffiness in the ear. So yeah, you know, sometimes there's some ocular symptoms that resolve with us. And uh, like light sensitivity I've seen. Um, uh, it definitely a lot of patients resolved with tinnitus, ringing ears, and stuffy ear feeling is a definite, to me, that's a, 
a red flag for TMD. So I have stuffy ears, um, headaches, migraines, has next pain, stiff muscles, clenches teeth, sore jaw. So in a nutshell, I'm going to just cut the chase on this one, but um, pre DTR on the top and post DTR uh, treatment all off. So um, probably had a better reading here, but the, the discussion time up top is, is lengthened. I, and um, we have much cleaner EMGs on the, on the, the bottom, but, uh, and we got our discussion time to 0.1 seconds. So if you see in the middle, there's a little graph that says their C to D or timeline where the patient's bite is. Um, testimony from the patient, I struggled with CMJ, jaw pain, neck pain, and chronic migraines for years. I would wake up in the morning with a very sore jaw and get three to four migraines a week. Um, just skip down. This is a procedure. I have no pain in my jaw. I don't wake up with neck or jaw pain. This happened gradually over a few months. My migraines have lessened in intensity and frequency. They are easily treated with medicine and they function much better. So, you know, some patients just going to eradicate it. But, you know, one of the things is to look at is, you know, if patients do have or, you know, migraines are kind of like the everyone wants to try to resolve all those in the medical profession. And my take is, well, you know, let's make sure that I've done my job, you know, I've screened you, I've done, you know, DTR, your, your, your bite's no longer contributory to, uh, you know, this, this syndrome. And more often than not, it, it reduces the amount, the intensity, the frequency. Um, and it, it definitely, you know, the trigeminal nucleus and mesenthymic nucleus is, is a really nasty uh, motor track. And um, in a sense of, of the pain and chronic pain and uh, cognitive, I mean, what it actually really does is we, we don't know, but it communicates, goes up high into central processing as well. So um, it can cause a lot of issues. Here's a, another patient that was kind of interesting. So this looks like a Christmas tree, you know, on the 24th of December, um, all lit up, uh, was referred to me. Sound of breakup, wishing change change face shape, chewing, severe muscle pain. Um, ear symptoms, tinnitus, dizziness, sinus pain. And a sinus pain isn't actually like you have a sinus infection. It's a, it's a referred pain. It's a pain from the muscles kind of pulling on the back of the sinus. The pterygoids, let up pterygoids and um, um, myeloid and all those muscles can pull on the sinus and um, cause some ache back there. Acute pain for months. Um, to P saw PCP and ENT at Harvard who recommended thought that she might have TMD. So luckily that um, doctor referred her said, you need to look into that. Uh, volume and ibuprofen would help. And that's fairly common. A lot of patients are pounding ibuprofen. Um, physical therapy can help, but it doesn't cause a problem. It just treats the symptoms and same with splints. So she had PT splints. So this patient is quote unquote locked. So it was, she's no really just closes down and that's it. I can either open or close, but there's no voluntary separation of the jaw where, you know, in normal function, the jaw is not meant to be kind of like you shut and it's locked. You're meant to be able to slide it around a little bit. And what happens is that, you know, you get this posterior engagement, you get the muscles firing. So this patient has a, a infinite exclusion time. I mean, it's never going to end. Um, you know, she can't get off her teeth. And so, you know, the baseline readings are pretty low, but the, the muscle spasm are pretty significant. And the, the left temporalis or the second red line from the bottom is, um, you know, showing that it's in, it's unable to fire. It's because it, it's inhibited. And then when she does grind and clench her strides, it's, it's hyperactive. And here you can see a larger uh, view of the, the EMG reading on this patient. And so, you see number 50, up top, number 15 is hit up high. Well, and dragging on, um, you're, you're seeing a con contralateral uh, <clears throat> temporalis muscle firing. So not to get into too much of this physiology, um, but here we are, balance contact. So the right looks better than the left. And in the solid bite, uh, this is how this patient cleaned up, left working movement, which is just the, the movement itself is within 0.31 seconds, so therapeutic. 
And this compares those two together, which I thought was a pretty significant um, change. Uh, so you see more, more up top, less on the bottom. Basically, you know, more, uh, more green and red, and on the bottom, we don't have as much. This is the right side statistics there. And the same thing, right side, there's no exclusion. Now she's got some exclusion, but you can see the intensity of the, the EMGs and the, the firings is a lot less. So, you know, she's acting as though she's trying to chew through, you know, a piece of meat the whole time, every time she, her teeth touched. And um, here's her corresponding, her pre and post DTR vowel. She still got a little itchiness and stuff, but significantly different. And this patient was fun to treat too. Um, but it was interesting because she, you know, part of her sense was that she had this wishing, breathing pulsative, pulsatile tinnitus, um, which is what she was diagnosed with, but that was um, basically relieved. I've, I've seen a lot of tinnitus go away with patients. It's, I don't ever promise anything, but we hope for good things, you know, with this. Um, so just a uh, second article. Uh, basically, this is a randomized controlled occlusal adjustment trial, um, and it is the most significant um, TMD evidence really to date that I, I, I've seen. Um, it has 100 dental stones, and they did the PTR, where it was, uh, I think, it was single blinded and um, had a great result. Conclusions chronic, painful, muscular TMD symptoms, functional restrictions, and the resultant levels of emotional depression from laying with chronic, painful symptoms were all dramatically improved. Then, treatment group within weeks after they underwent eye cage. Symptoms improvements were maintained over just the six month period of observation. However, the placebo polishing, this was the control group, was able to initiate a placebo effect within the uh, control subjects. So they, they either did the procedure or they, they basically tricked them because they were first year dental students and didn't know what they were getting. If they, were, they had the symptoms and then um, they either did the actual DTR or they did just a a hard polish on them. And so that's how they did this. Um, so this is nice because this is the one that there's no other uh, studies in TMD treatments, such as like, you know, there's different schools of thought and, uh, that, that has shown this, this level of evidence. So this is, is really, really nice and hopefully it can be um, repeated here in the US. Um, here's a, another one other factor that I see with patients that I always ask the screen for is sleep apnea. So can okay, just switch gears here for a little bit and then have a few minutes for questions. Um, but this is a, a you know, a, basically a questionnaire to help you think about maybe you, this person has sleep apnea. Um, this is the, the stop bang. Um, do you, you know, snore, are you tired? Anyone observe you stop breathing in your sleep? Have you, uh, are you being treated with blood pressure? Takes into account BMI, age, next circumference. And um, so, and it gives you a corresponding scale for that. So you've probably seen this. And here's an, a little bit of a simpler one, um, the upward sleepiness scale. And you know, both these can be used to, to screen someone who may have um, concern over the airways and um, you know, uh, need further evaluation. Because that does actually contribute a lot to some of these pain disorders. And now in dentistry, there's a lot more um, attention to airways, breathing, sleep, all that. Um, if there is obstructive sleep apnea, typically the treatments are surgery, uh, appliances, mandibular advancement appliances, or CPAPs are the, the three real ways to, do, to deal with this. The surgeries themselves aren't done as, as often. Um, you know, dental appliances are, are do work really well for this. I don't personally make these, uh, but I know those who do. And obviously the CPAP is not a popular, but it is effective. Patients really don't like those. Um, so anyhow, that that's that. Are there any questions? You're still awake. You're still here. <laughs> Y'all wowed? <laughs> One of my questions has been, like I've had, I've had psychologists reach out on the listserv, for example, and say, looking for any other alternative to a patient with chronic migraines. And I've written about this, right? Because it's not 
known, I don't think, among the psychological community as an option. But I know that you can't help everyone with migraines, but you are able to diagnose those who would benefit from the treatment? Is there anything we should know that would kind of rule yeah, out? It's basically screening. It's, you know, it's screening and doing my job saying, okay, well, if TMD is a contributory factor to the migraines, if I can get them into exclusion time or they have head symptoms, well, they're going to have head symptoms. They're going to have other facial stuff. Um, it depends on how long they've had migraine, migraines, you know, but basically it's enough where if I do my job and that's one less factor it's one less input into that whole migraine equation and for some people that will be significant some people it may not do do anything um except make, make their bite more comfortable but it's it's one of those where i have to do my i do my job within the clinical um the way at least i see it uh, clinically within you know half a second exclusion time and then um uh we'll see what happens so you know a lot of these are uh treatments and the more I'd say extreme they are like you know the tinnitus the the vertigo the you know migraines um I really don't guarantee you know I'm, I'm hopeful I'm you know I, I screen these patients and say yes you're candidate I can get you into ETR but I, I can't really see how well it's going to work for you. but I I gotta say that everyone that I've seen you know with exception of maybe one migraine person, like because you always remember the ones that don't work, right? All the good clients you worked on are fine, great. They're all passed out, but the ones that didn't, you're, it's what we all focus on. But so I, I can think one, but I've seen a lot of people do well with it. But I mean, the main thing is it's not really well understood in dentistry. So we're really, really, really behind. I mean, from the major, um, it's just funny, I just, is that the awareness is really gonna have to come from patients and patients' experiences and, and posting and social media and YouTube or whatever, because it there's a there's like a hex curse on this in American dental schools. And it's unfortunate because people are really the um are people that are really trying to treat, whether it's you know not using the tech scan sensors, whether it's not understanding the influences, they're the ones suffering, which is kind of oh, why I do this. Since it is a slightly newer updated treatment, is it covered by insurance most of the time? Um, probably maybe not, no. I mean, we don't see a whole lot of reimbursement for it. Um, it's not actually, the, you know, it's funny, it's, a, it's not really that new. Um, it's been, it was discovered in, in 87, the sensor, tech scan sensor came out in 84. Um, and I think that's probably part of the reason why it just wasn't, hasn't been widely adopted so much. And then, um, um, and so it was almost before the technology curve. And I think dentists were just so scared of technology in general at, in the 84 or 87, can you imagine? You know, you have Atari and then you have T-Scan. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, the reimbursements aren't a lot. You know, this treatment's not exorbitantly expensive. You know, it ranges from, 1500 to maybe 5,000, maybe, um, maybe my patient might need some crowns of rehabilitation, but for most people with what they're going through, um, it's really a small fee. I consider if it, you know, they truly are having a lot of these symptoms. I just want to say, thank you so much. If anyone else has other questions, I'll, I will forward that article and Jim's contact information, but appreciate, um, your time and we're Thank doing you, Oasis Network on your behalf. So. Well, yeah, reach out to me if you have any questions. My email is jimoshetsky at gmail. Um, my last name isn't Quimby, it's Oshetsky, but <laughs> some people think that I'm Jim Quimby. Except when so, we travel, yeah. Okay. Travel. <laughs> All, All right, right, guys. Thank have a great yeah. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so Jim. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Let's see.